Well, good morning once again, dear church family, and God bless you. I think that I'm not done praying for people once again. This is kind of a habit, but that's okay. I do think we should be in prayer for, for Kent after the loss of his mom. I do think we should be in prayer for uh, our brother Glenn's boy, Adam, who injured himself sort of seriously, both legs, had some serious surgery on the inside, hey? And that's going to take a while for him to get up and walking again. And uh, we, we need to be in prayer for these things. So I'd like to pray for these two things. We, maybe you'd join your heart with mine now. Let's do that. Father God, in Jesus' name, uh, we rejoice in loving community, community that you created. And uh, it models itself after you, Lord, our triune God, who's been in loving community for all eternity. We thank you, God, for our dear brothers and sisters and those that we love those connected with our families, those who are in our families, and those who are part of this church here. Uh, Lord, today we think about Ken Walters. We love him. We love Terry. We thank you for Ken's presence here, God. We thank you that he's uh, a smiling face, handing out uh, bulletins to people faithfully. And uh, Lord, uh, we know that he's mourning the loss of his mom, and so we pray for him. We pray for his family. We pray that by the Spirit of God, there's a, a touch of comfort there that comes to that home and for all those connected uh, with this lady's passing who don't know you in a saving way, O oh God, we pray that uh, this brings home the reality of death and the reality of the judgment that follows after. And so we pray that you use this to remind people of infinitely important truths, and we pray that somehow souls will be saved because of how you ministered to them, even through dark things like the death of a loved one. We pray today, Lord, for, for our dear brother uh, Glenn, and we uh, pray for his boy, Adam. Uh, Lord God, we pray that uh, you would, out of the abundance of your grace, mercy, and power, touch that boy's legs, that the, the wounds that are there would heal, even supernaturally, Lord, a miraculous healing, and we pray that he'd be up and functional again, and all honor and glory and thanks would go to you. And we pray, Lord, for his peace as he sits in the hospital. We pray, God, that you fill his days with thoughts of good things that please you, encouraging things that thrill his heart. We pray, Lord, that you direct him to your word and have him to meditate upon uh, infinitely important truths that will edify and build him up and encourage him. So we lift up these two things, these two precious people and their families and those connected to them. We lift them up in the mighty and precious name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, friends, we are back in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. And um, I'm just going to record this, too, because... Sometimes it doesn't record properly. It's good to have a backup. So we're in the book of Deuteronomy. We'll be in Deuteronomy chapter 5 this morning. So if, if you just want to take your pew Bible and locate Deuteronomy chapter 5. And um, if I was going to entitle this sermon something, I would call it the Ten Commandments Revisited. Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Ten Commandments Revisited. Remember in the book of Exodus chapter 20, we were given the account of how Moses went up Mount Sinai and God gave him the Ten Commandments, the tables of the law, two tables of the law. God wrote them with his finger on these stones, the Ten Commandments, and we want to talk about that. Uh, just as an aid to the memory, though, remember last week uh, as we were considering Deuteronomy 4 and, in fact, by extension, the whole of Deuteronomy we saw major elements, major themes beginning to emerge in the book of Deuteronomy. We saw a land promised to God's people. We saw mention of images of the divine. Love relationship was a factor. Law was a factor. And the breaking of the law, rebellion was a factor, and so was the promise of restoration. And in fact, those six elements there in Deuteronomy 4 they show up everywhere in Deuteronomy, and in fact, th those are the grand themes of the entire Bible, a message of hope for Israel and a message of hope for the world. Remember that from last week. God created the world back in Genesis. It was very good, land for God's people, God's image bearers, Adam and Eve on the earth. They were in love relationship, one with another and with God. God gave them a commandment, law. They broke that law. They rebelled. Uh, there was punishment and yet there was the promise of restoration. And th that's a promise that God's making to the entire created order. That's uh, Romans, the eighth chapter. The whole created order right now is groaning and travailing together in pain 
because of man's rebellion against God. But one day there will be a beautiful, glorious restoration of the created order. We're waiting for that. The redemption of our bodies. Right now, spiritually, we are new creatures in Christ, but our bodies still groan and travail together in pain. Our bodies still house sin in them. Paul tells us that, doesn't he? Romans, the seventh chapter. It, there is, in me, says Paul, that is in my flesh, there is no good thing. We're still waiting for the redemption of the whole created order in Christ Jesus. And it, by God, it will happen. It will happen. We just need to be patient and wait for it. Okay? Well, here we are, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5. Let's read uh, the first six verses, and then let's talk about it, okay? So here's Moses now, 3,400 years ago, or 1,400 B.C. Moses reminds Israel about the giving of the law. Here it is, 5.1. Moses called all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, and that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. For the, the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb, that's Mount Sinai, another name for Sinai. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. The Lord talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire, and I stood between the Lord and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire, and did, you did not go up the mountain. He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And right after this, he gives the Ten Commandments. Can we get the next image there? I think I have an image of the Ten Commandments. Okay, obviously not a photograph of the, <laughs> the actual Ten Commandments, but there they are. You know, it's kind of artistic, but here are two tables of the law, and th these are the Ten Commandments that were given uh, to Moses by God on Mount Sinai. And we want to talk about these things here. Uh, we want to talk about the Ten Commandments because you and I today, well, friends, we're not Israelites, are we? We're not living in the days of Moses. We're New Testament, New Covenant believers in Jesus. We are New Covenant priests, says Peter and John. We are, there's something different about the church. We're different and distinct from Israel. And we need to understand the New Covenant believers' relationship to the law, specifically the Ten Commandments. Now, this is territory we've already gone over. Back in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, we spent some time on that. But God thought it was important to repeat this, so I think as your pastor, it's important to repeat this. I mean, if God says we're going to go over it again, I think the church is going to go over it again. <laughs> and maybe you forgot some of this, so let's just look at it together. I want to do this specifically because many in the church... And I know people who talk like this. They say, you know what? All we need to do is just follow the Ten Commandments. Even New, even new Covenant Christians. Just, just follow the Ten Commandments. Doesn't that sound kind of uh, reasonable? It sounds even commonsensical. I mean, look at that first commandment. No other gods before our God. Oh, that sounds pretty like something we'd want to follow, for sure. We have... Uh, the commandment not to make an idol and bow down to it, don't misuse the name of the Lord. Those sound pretty reasonable. We have commandments uh, not to steal and don't commit adultery and don't kill. I mean, that sounds pretty right on. We could get behind that kind of thing. But what about the Sabbath law? Look at that, that fifth commandment there. Or that, sorry, the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Now, if you read that Sabbath commandment, uh, first of all, Sabbath falls on a Saturday. How many of us are doing everything we're supposed to do on the Saturday in accordance with the Mosaic law? Probably not many of us. Uh, obviously, there's something different here about the way the New Testament Christian is to regard the Ten Commandments and how a a Jew living in the days of Moses was to regard the Ten Commandments and obey them. There's something different here, and, and we should acknowledge it. To just say, let's just follow the Ten Commandments, it's, can I say it gently? It's overly simplistic. It's, in fact, a little juvenile. And we're not babes in Christ anymore. We're maturing spiritually, and we want to have a better understanding of this. In Paul's epistle to the Galatians, chapter 3 and verse 19, 
Paul tells us that the law was added. Now, he, he's saying this in response to a question. He says, why the law? Wherefore the law? What's the point of the law? Why did God give us the Mosaic law? His response, Galatians 3.19, the law was added because of transgressions till this seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now, in context, the seed there is Jesus the Lord. If you read Galatians 3, in, just read the whole chapter, the seed, Jesus. The law, says Paul, was added. In other words, the Mosaic law is parenthetical. God created the world. There was no Mosaic law. The law at, was added until the seed would come. That's Jesus. The law is parenthetical. It, it intruded for a specific purpose, and it had a time limit. It had an expiration date. It's like you go to the store and you buy milk. I buy it by the gallon. Anyone who knows me knows that. I should just buy a cow maybe. I don't know. But um, it has an expiration date on it, right? That reminds me, uh, some people age like fine wine. I heard, heard this before. Some people age like fine wine, and others age like milk. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, use that as you see fit <laughs> as you walk through this life. Anyways, um, the Mosaic Law had a time limit. It had a purpose. It had an expiration date. Expiration date, roughly 32 AD, when Jesus came into the world. He's the seed to whom the promise uh, was made. We have people telling us that we need to obey, even in the church, even the New Testament Christian, he must obey the letter of the Mosaic Law. I run into folks like this often when I speak at conferences. And that is, that's incorrect. In fact, Paul wrote a whole epistle, the epistle to the, to the Galatians, to address the problem. He said, don't get back under the yoke of the Mosaic Law. You are not under law, you're under grace. There's a new relationship been established now between God and his covenant people, the church. In these days, it's the church. And um, some folks want to say, well, this Sabbath law, it, this predates the Mosaic law. The Mosaic law may have been added, but the Sabbath law was not added at that time. The Sabbath law comes long before the Mosaic law. And I just want us to take a look again at verse 2. Look at Deuteronomy 5, 2. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, those who are here today, all of us who are alive. I think it's pretty clear that the Sabbath law, part of the Ten Commandments, was given in Sinai, at Sinai. It was not given before. It was one of those aspects of the Mosaic law. The whole Mosaic law, in fact, was added. It's parenthetical. And in fact, I'd like you to take a look at Nehemiah chapter 9. If you could turn there if you like. If you don't want to, that's okay. But Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, and verse 13. Nehemiah, now this comes long after Israel went into exile and then was then returned back to her homeland. And here's uh, Nehemiah, and he has some statements he wants to make. Verse 13, Nehemiah speaking to the Lord. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath. The law is given in Sinai. That's when the Sabbath command was given. And in fact, one more verse, Psalm 147 and then we'll return to Deuteronomy. But Psalm 147, I'll just quickly go there. Verse 19, speaking of the Lord. Psalm 147, 19, He, that's the Lord, He declares His word to Jacob, His statutes and His judgments to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any nation, and as for His judgments, they have not known them. Now, you put all this together, it becomes very clear. The nations were not given the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath law. Israel was not given the Ten Commandments, including Sabbath law, until Sinai, until Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 20. And I, I think that's pretty clear. 
So the law was added, it's parenthetical, it has a definite purpose, and it has a time limit. And that's not just the Ten Commandments, that's all 613 commandments which make up the Mosaic Law. And these 613 commandments given from God to Moses prescribe to Israel specific regulations for proper relationship between people and between people and God. And these 613 commandments are distilled down into 10 commandments, okay? But the whole edifice that we call the Mosaic Law is built upon an eternal foundation of love. And this is as your, this is as, as your pastor understands this. Love relationship is not parenthetical. It doesn't have a time limit. It doesn't just have some specific purpose and then it's done with. Love relationship is eternal. It's been eternal in the community we call the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit have been in love relationship from eternity past, and they will persist in love relationship into eternity future. Okay? And the Mosaic law is built upon this love foundation, this eternal love foundation. And we know that because when Jesus was asked in Matthew 22, good teacher, what is the greatest commandment? What is the chief commandment of the law? And Jesus said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, says Jesus, hang all the law and the prophets. So for Jesus... There's something different about those two commandments. Love God with everything you have. We'll get to that one day. We're going to get to Deuteronomy 6, maybe next week. You're to love God with absolutely everything that you are, and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the foundation of the law. This This is what the law is trying to express to us in these minute commandments. And once you've got it, and once you understand you can't keep this law from your heart, there's no way you can do it on your own, and you come to Jesus, he establishes with you a new covenant. Not the covenant made at Sinai, a new covenant. We'll talk about that. What we can say is this, after Calvary, after the cross, after Christ's atoning work on the cross and his victorious resurrection from the dead, the Mosaic law, as law, mind you, as a system of do's and don'ts, the Mosaic law is set aside. It does not impose itself upon the Christian because we are under a new covenant. In fact, the Old Testament looked forward to the new covenant, didn't it? The new covenant. It's a better covenant. It's better promises and a new priesthood and a different sacrifice. I mean, the book of Hebrews is super saturated, to use one of my slogans, right? The New, the new Testament, particularly the book of Hebrews, is absolutely overflowing with passages speaking of the superiority of Christ's new covenant over and against the covenant that God made with Israel at Sinai. And so the Mosaic law as law is set aside now. We're not under that. But the foundation, love, is eternal and remains, unchangeable, irrevisible. God is love. We're told that very clearly. God has existed in love relationship from eternity. And guess what? I mean, you are called into that. And this is the Apostle John sort of invites us into this, doesn't he? He says, our, fe- our fellowship is with God the Father and his son Jesus. And you're invited into that eternal love relationship. And once you become a Christian, that can never be taken from you. You can't be robbed of that. And there's an eternal home in the heavens waiting for you and waiting for me where we will enjoy love relationship with the Father. And of course, if I'm going to be very precise about this, Heaven comes down to earth at some point in the future, doesn't it? Heavenly Jerusalem, the tabernacle of God is with man. And we will enjoy a relationship with our Father and with our Savior forever. And we'll enjoy one another's relationship forever too. Our, our community doesn't just end here at death. It persists beyond the grave. So we better learn to get along with each other, right? <laughs> Not like we have a great problem here, but it's always good to say it, right? <laughs> Paul tells us in his epistle to Timothy, the first epistle to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1.9, Paul says, the law, the Mosaic law now, as law, 
It's not made for the righteous. And of course, you and I, as Christians, we are declared the righteousness of God in Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Mosaic Law is not for us. It's for the unrighteous. And actually, Paul lists off there in 1 Timothy a whole list of people the law is for. It's for the unrighteous, the ungodly, the sinner, the wicked, the man-stealer, the manslayer, the murderer, the adulterer. The law is for those people. It's to show them something. It's to show them how, how far they are from God's holy standards. You see? The law as law, not for us, though still very useful. Well, let's take a look at those Ten Commandments. Let's review them once again. Uh, but notice, please, the context. Look at verse 6. This is sort of our run-up into the review of the Ten Commandments. Verse 6, God says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. We are reminded right there of the supreme order of things, an order that cannot be set aside. There's something about this. It's very important. Redemption always comes first, then the commandments start, right? This is very important. It's, this is how it is in the New Testament. You can be the most wicked, vile sinner that's ever walked the earth. Let's take care of that first. Then we'll God, God will instruct you on how to live. Let's get you saved. Let's get you washed. Let's get you regenerated. Let's get Christ's blood to do its cleansing work on you. And then we're going to start talking what's required of you, day by day, moment by moment, right? That's important. You don't say, well, I guess I'll clean myself up first, and then when I'm good and clean, and I've, I've just engaged in a rigorous program of self-reformation, then and only then will I come to church and maybe find Jesus. That is absolutely backwards. It's not what the New Testament prescribes. The Bible says you come just like you are, as vile as you are, as vile as you think you are, you can come to Jesus, and he will in no wise cast you out. He loves you. In fact, he loves you so much, he refuses to leave you the way you are. How about that? Lenny and I were just talking about this recently. It's like God looks at you, and he sees how despicable you are, and how sinful you are, how wicked you are in your mind, and he sees the long list of sins you've committed, a horrible sin debt you've accrued, and he says, dear child, I love you so much, I won't leave you like that. You come, you bring th those problems to me, and I'll handle those for you. See that? Isn't that wonderful? What a Savior. What a God. No God like that one. Man could never invent a God like that one, ever. He said, let's get you cleaned up. And then I'll tell you what's required of you, you know? And um, that's the structure of Paul's letters in the New Testament. Paul wants to get the theology taken care of first. He wants you to know who Jesus is first, how preeminent he is, how wonderful he is, what he did for you, what he did for me. And then the latter half of his epistles, that's the practical stuff. That's where he gets down to, okay, uh, here's how you're to walk now in light of this new birth that you've experienced. You are a new creature in Christ Jesus, and uh, you're to walk like that in newness of life, and here's some practical instructions for you. And that's how Paul has ordered his epistles, too. And you, you can clearly see the order. It's there in the Old Testament. God says, you're redeemed. Now here, here's how I want you to order your life. Here's how I want you to structure your life. And, um, and I think this might be a little bit irritating to some people that come to me. They ask for prayer for someone they love. And one of the first things I'll ask is, is the person saved? Are they a Christian? That has got to be first. Often when I meet people, I, I want to know, are you a Christian man? Are you a Christian lady? I, I, I need to know, because that needs to be taken care of first, right? And then we talk about other stuff. Um, and then, and oftentimes you ask somebody, are you a Christian lady? Are you a Christian woman? Are you a Christian man? And so oftentimes they say, yes, I am. And then let's talk a little bit more to find out what you take a Christian to be, <laughs> right? Now, it's not like we want to put people under the microscope and we're going to split theological hairs and, and, and uh, microanalyze people and just look for some way to charge them with heresy. That is not what we want to do here. 
But to be a Christian, friends, it requires that you understand that Jesus is God in the flesh and that you were guilty of sin and your sin guilt was sufficient for God to justly throw you into hell. But God in Christ reconciled the world to himself. Jesus went to the cross. His death paid the penalty for your sins and mine. And if you will come to him by faith alone and say, Lord Jesus, I, I, believe the, I believe you are what the Bible says you are. I believe that you did on that cross what the Bible says you did. You paid for my sins. Now please save me, forgive me, and be my Lord. I mean, if you do something like that, then you're a Christian. And that's pretty simple, isn't it? Easy, no. Simple, yes. Not very complicated at all. And, and God has structured it this way on purpose so that you couldn't go to him on the judgment day and say, Lord, this was just so complicated, I couldn't figure it out. I was not especially brilliant. <laughs> I couldn't figure out this salvation program you launched into the world. It was too complicated for me. Th you won't have that excuse. It's a simple transaction. You're a guilty sinner. Punishable. You were to be punished. Jesus came into the world and took your punishment. And you appropriate the benefits of what he did, salvation, home in heaven, by faith alone. I believe you, Jesus. It doesn't cost you money. It doesn't mean you've got to sign your name on some document hard to read or, uh, or make all kinds of crazy vows or do all kinds of ordinances and all kinds of rituals. And it doesn't mean that you, you know, whatever, I'm not going to get into it. You know, you know what I'm saying. It's just so simple. It's beautifully simple. Well, let's look at those Ten Commandments for a, a few minutes here. If you really love the Lord, Jesus said, greatest commandment is to love the Lord. If you're a New Testament Christian and you love the Lord, you really love him, guess what? You won't have any other gods before God, will you? You're not going to elevate something or somebody else as the supreme authority in your life, you're not going to do that. It almost seems like, um, it seems so needless, isn't it? The first commandment seems needless to a Christian. I love the Lord. He's the ultimate court of appeal, the final authority in my life. It, it, you wouldn't have to say to me, now John, now make sure you don't put anything above God now. Make sure you don't have any other, you know, a special authority that's above God. You don't have to tell me that. It's kind of like um, a marriage, you know? A, a marriage as it's supposed to be under God. I love my dear wife. She loves me. Now, do I have to tell her? Okay, now, Lindy, I now, now, re now remember, you shouldn't be cheating on me now. Well, that's the most ridiculous thing. She, of course she's not going to go cheating on me. Or my children. Do I have to say, now, 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 remember, children, no spitting on your dad. No, don't spit at your dad now. What, what kind of silly thing would that be? They love their dad. They're never going to do that. The, the Ten Commandments are kind of like that for the Christian. Of course, I'm not going to bow down to some idol. I'm not going to make some idol and bow down to that thing. I have an understanding of who God is. He created me. He holds me in existence. He enlightens the mind of man. He makes it possible for me to think and evaluate things logically and morally. He sets the standards. He declares how things ought to be and he writes into my heart a sensitivity to those things. He gives us the objective standards we need. He gives us the authoritative revelation we need to navigate through this life. Now, how stupid would it be for me to create some kind of lifeless idol and start worshiping that thing? It hasn't, did, didn't do anything for me in this life, and for sure it didn't shed one drop of blood to secure my redemption. What a silly thing that would be to command me that. I won't take his name in vain. I would... Never kick around the name Jesus. Why would I ever do that? That's the name by which we are saved. There is none other name given among men from heaven through which we are saved or by which we are saved. I mean, that's the name above every name. That's the name that knees, all knees will bend to that name. And in fact, Hebrews 1, 6 says, right there in heaven, God commands the angels, all of them, no stragglers, all the angels of God, worship him, Jesus of Nazareth. Of course I'm not going to misuse a name like that. Beautiful name of Jesus. Well, here's that Sabbath law. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. 
How, what are we going to do with that one? Well, listen, the Bible says that Christ came to give us rest. You will find rest for your souls. As I understand, Sabbath law is applied in two ways to a new covenant Christian. First of all, we no longer want to be walking around with the burden of sin on us. And God told the people of Israel through the prophet Isaiah, you are a people laden with iniquity. You are heavy laden with iniquity. Jesus said, come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. You let Jesus take care of that sin debt of yours. And you rest. Secondly, you stop trying to earn your own salvation through good works. Just rest. Be still and know he is God. Let's rightly apply that passage. And the Christian doesn't just set aside one day, one hour where God gets special attention. The Christian wants to give every moment of every day, every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, moment by moment. We, we take sp special care to make Christ preeminent in our lives. It's a much greater standard, isn't it, than simply not doing work on a particular day of the, of the week. Oh, honor mother and father. There's that fifth commandment, honor mother and father. Why? Well, because home and family was created by God. It reflects in some ways the Trinity, loving community. And when God created man in his own image and likeness, he looked at Adam and he said, not good. How about that? Is it because Adam was a wreck, a ruin, and a chaos? No. It's because man was alone and it wasn't good. So God created a help meet for him. Home and family was created right there. And then God said, very good. The home and family, mom, dad, children, very good in the eyes of God. It's the first society, humanly speaking, that God created. And we have respect for that societal unit. We, that means we have respect for the office, mom and dad, and we respect the people who are in that office, in those offices, right? Of course, of course. No adultery. Again, the marriage relationship. Think about Think of it from a New Testament Christian's perspective. Man and woman in, in marriage commitment to each other. They're married. Paul says that reflects something in the world. That is a type of something. That is a symbol of the relationship that the believer has with Jesus. It's precious. It's beautiful. It's a witness. It symbolizes something that's really, really important. Of course I'm not going to commit adultery on my wife. First of all, I love my dear wife. But there's a whole lot riding on this, right? It's, it's a whole lot being symbolized here. We are preaching a message with the way we conduct ourselves in home and family, aren't we? Yes. No stealing. If you really not love your neighbor as you love yourself, obviously you won't be kicking down the door stealing his TV or whatever else he has that you might be interested in, <laughs> Right? If you're really doing what Jesus said, loving neighbor as yourself, you won't steal from him. You'll be happy for him because he has the things he has. You don't tell lies about people. Our God cannot lie. It's not that he just chooses to tell the truth, but God by nature is the truth, and he doesn't lie. He doesn't lie about people. He doesn't lie to people. And if we really love our neighbors, we won't lie about them. We won't bear false testimony. You won't need to tell me that because I love him and I won't lie about him, see? And no coveting. We touched on that. You'll be happy for your, oh, your neighbor's got a nice big truck, nice new truck. I'm happy for my neighbor. I don't say, well, how come I can't have a vehicle like that? How come I don't get to drive a thing like that? If you, you, if you really love somebody, you won't be covetous. And I never forgot, maybe I mentioned this, I'll mention it again. I remember when Alicia was in... Uh, Awana clubs many years ago, and they had their cub cars. They were making their little, you know, wooden cub cars. And uh, they were judging the cars on how they look. And her friend Sarah, different Sarah, uh, won, a, won a trophy for her car, for how it looked. And you couldn't fake my daughter's reaction to that. Yeah, you just could not fake. She was not pretending to be happy. She was seriously happy for her friend. Sarah won. Ha! Oh, I'm so happy. You know, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Not, oh, she gets a trophy. How come I don't get a trophy? No, no. It's not like that. See, that, that's something beautiful in the heart of a child, hey? 
Would to God that we would retain that little speck of purity there. All these, did I forget number six? Oh, no murder. Well, that's just a little one. <laughs> oh, that's just the, uh, almost a footnote, isn't it? <laughs> okay, thank you so much, dear. <laughs> How much do we have to expand upon this one? If you love your neighbor, you obviously won't take his life <laughs> from him. Right? Obviously. In fact, you'll do what you can to preserve his life, wouldn't you? And Jesus tells a little story about that, doesn't he? About a man who fell among the thieves. And um, we have priestly class coming past and doing nothing to help this poor man, and yet a Samaritan comes and does everything he can to preserve that man's life and to nurse him back to health. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. Right? He was responding to the question, who's my neighbor? Love my neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Oh, Jesus is so brilliant. He has a little story to tell on that one, doesn't he? If you really love your neighbor, you won't kill him. <laughs> You'll do everything you can to preserve his life. All these Ten Commandments, they do reflect that eternal foundation of love that they're built upon, don't they? They're built upon love. They reflect love. The law as law for the Christian is not needed anymore. I don't need these things to prescribe for me how to live. But the law, the Mosaic law for the Christian is still very, very useful. It's precious. It's valuable. It is no less valuable than anything else in the Bible. We don't roll it up and throw it away. I don't want you to ever get that impression. The law as law still restrains evil. It restrained evil in Israel back in Mosaic times. It also made Israel unique, too. Uh, I mean, think about the Mosaic. Under the Mosaic law, murderers were cap capital punishment, right? There's a deterrent right there. At least that guy won't re repeat his crime. So the Mosaic law did restrain evil, but it did keep Israel quite distinct from her neighbors. Israel's neighbors did not have a wise moral law like this one. And the intent was, remember, the nations were supposed to look at Israel and say, what a wise and understanding people. Look at the law that they live under. Paul tells us that, that the Mosaic law makes us aware of sin. He tells us in Romans 3.20, the law, by the law, he says, comes the knowledge of sin. The Mosaic law is very useful in pointing out that we are so far from God's holy standards. That was one of the reasons for the law. Among other things, the law does show us our need for a Savior. Paul tells us in Romans, the sixth chapter, the law entered that the offense might abound. When you read the Mosaic law and the holy standards of God as given to Israel and the foundation of love that it's built upon, you consider where you are, you see, you get some kind of understanding of how far you are from God's holy standards and therefore, your need for a savior. You could never save yourself. You could never fix this sin problem that you have. I couldn't either. I've offended the ultimate worthy being. Now, what kind of sacrifice am I possibly going to offer to atone for my sin debt? I would have to offer the ultimate worthy sacrifice. I can't do that. This is what the Mosaic law in its ceremonial aspects was supposed to teach people. Year by year, Yom Kippur comes, the Day of Atonement, sacrifice are, sacrifices are offered. Year after year after year, the writer of the Hebrew says, get the message. None of these sacrifices were really, really taking away sin. By the law comes the knowledge of sin, the knowledge of our sin debt, the insufficiency of the Mosaic law to really take care of us in this regard. We needed a savior. And so the Mosaic law, among other things, predicts for us the coming of the savior. In the Mosaic law, you read about a prophet coming, Deuteronomy 18, a prophet like Moses was going to come. And God would put his words on that prophet's lips. And you were to listen to that prophet. And that prophet was Jesus. He is the prophet to come. He's the one that would take our sin dead upon himself. He's the one that would save the world. He's the Lamb of God. In Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, we read about a new covenant that's promised. If anyone, even in Old Testament times, happened to be reading carefully the entire 39 books of the Old Testament, they would have understood that the Mosaic law was insufficient 
to atone for our sin problem. And therefore, they would have been looking very anxiously, along with the, the prophet Jeremiah, for this new covenant, the new covenant, where God would take away that stony heart out of your flesh and he would give, give you a heart of flesh. He would write his laws on your heart and he would take away your sin debt and mine. 1,400 years after Moses was given the law, 1,400 years, mind you, here came Jesus into the world. There was John the Baptist, that strange figure, baptizing people in the Jordan River. All the people came out to see this strange man, baptizing people. And one day, he looked over the hill and he saw someone coming to him. The carpenter from Nazareth has arrived. And John pointed to him and he directed all attention to him. And he said, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We've been waiting for him. Here he is. He was, he's the one that's going to establish that long-awaited new covenant. And one night, at the end of Christ's earthly ministry, Jesus sat in an upper room with his 12 disciples at the dinner table at Passover time. And when they were done eating, he picked up the chalice with wine in it. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. It's a way better covenant. We don't want to be under that Mosaic covenant. You don't want to be under that law. You break one of those commandments, you've had it. And who hasn't broken them? The new covenant, infinitely better, established by someone who's infinitely better than Moses, by nature, and it makes much better promises to us, infinitely better, as a matter of fact. Friends, that's why we gather here, because we are partakers of this infinitely better new covenant with an infinitely worthy prophet and an infinitely worthy high priest who laid down his life to pay our sin debt, who ministers on our behalf in the third heaven now, day by day, making intercession for the saints. I hope this never gets old for you. It never gets old for me. All right. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'll just wrap it up right there. Praise the Lord. I'm going to offer a prayer for all of us, and then um, Lindy and I have to be going, okay? Let's pray together, friends. Father God, in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, our Lord, we just thank you, God, this morning. We thank you from our hearts for not abandoning us, not leaving us to flounder, not leaving us on the road to hell. We thank you, God, that out of the abundance of your mercy and your wisdom, you saved us. We thank you, Jesus, that you are made to us the righteousness and wisdom of God and that we have victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave in you, Jesus. So help us, God, to have these important, infinitely important truths before our eyes, in our hearts, at the front of our minds, moment by moment, day by day, as we walk through this life. Help us, God, to be the kind of people who bring you honor and glory, the kind of people who are, who are about Father's business and who are active and fruitful in every good word and work. So we lift up our praise and thanks to you, our great God and Savior, in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, God bless you all.